What do you treasure? If your home uh, caught on fire or there's like a flash flood uh, besides your pets and people, uh, what would you go in and grab? All right, I'm going to give you five seconds to think about it. All right, what would you grab? Your purse, your wallet, photo albums, all right? You would grab a lot of different things. Some of you might grab some stuff from your childhood. Some of you might grab a receipt that you really desperately need because you need to return something, right? And so, uh, hey, uh, we grab a lot of different things. And so that kind of shows us what do we treasure? What do we treasure in that, in that pivotal point? Uh, what do we treasure? We all have things that we treasure. This morning, we're going to look at something that is imperishable. That it's an imperishable treasure, an unchanging treasure. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you turn to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. When you get there, if you would say word, uh, that'll let us know that you are uh, found the right book and chapter. Luke is in the second half of your Bible called the New Testament. Uh, We believe that this is the word of God. This morning, I'd like us to look at Luke chapter 2 and think about treasuring Jesus above everything else. Treasuring Jesus above everything else. I'm going to go ahead and give you the big idea at the beginning. We're going to look through Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 20. We just finished up Luke chapter 1 last week. And so Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 20 says this, when we treasure Jesus above everything else, we find a new perspective. When we treasure Jesus above everything else, we find a new perspective. You're going to see some people today that find a new perspective. Some of them uh, are, are just seeing Jesus, hearing about him. He's being born Uh, This isn't just a passage we preach at Christmas, uh, but we can preach it all year long, right? Uh, That Jesus came as a baby. So when we treasure Jesus above everything else, we find a new perspective. Uh, For those of you who think I planned this out for Mother's Day, you would be wrong, okay? I had no idea how long it was going to take us to get through Luke chapter 1, and it took a while. Because how many verses are in Luke chapter 1? 80. Okay, those of you with your Bibles open, you can answer that question easy. Okay, some of you with your scrolling, you have to scroll a little quicker. Okay, uh, some of you say word awfully quick, I think. It's because you're, you know, you got you to hand up on us on the tablets. And so Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Luke, 20, Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. So Jesus is born at a time it's under Roman rule. Caesar Augustus, Quirinius are in positions of power, and God's people are an oppressed people. They're living in Israel under Roman rule. Look at verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So when it says they went up from Galilee, it's really talking about elevation, not direction. If you have a a map portion in your Bible, as a kid, that was always my favorite portion. I'd spend a lot of time in the sermon in that portion, uh, even though he was not talking about maps at all. I just found it fascinating. So we were talking about elevation, not direction here when it says he went up. If they bypassed Samaria, which was very common, Bethlehem was about 90 miles from Nazareth. It was almost seven miles south-southwest of Jerusalem. So Joseph is being obedient to the Roman government. He's going there for the census. Caesar Augustus and Quirinius could only see what was right in front of them. They were just doing what they thought was best. They were having a census, trying to track all the people. They were not able to see that God's plan had said many years ago that the baby would be born where? In Bethlehem. So Caesar Augustus and Quirinius were, uh, were just part of this plan. 400 years before the birth of Christ, God had told his people that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Look at Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephethah, Who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is able to be ruler in Israel. Whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So Micah 5 is a fulfillment of Luke chapter 2 verse 11. Let me kind of break it down for us. On a day, this is real history, this really happened. 
Uh, you won't meet many people who don't believe Jesus uh, uh, li- didn't live, right? Okay. You, you, it, scholars would agree with this on both sides. Um, atheists, m- most atheist historians are like, Jesus definitely was a real person because there's just too much recorded about him. So this is on a day in real history, in a city, in a real city, city of Bethlehem, the Savior. What did that mean? That he had come to take away all of our guilt. He was spelling it out for the people, the Christ, that he was going to fulfill all our hopes, the Lord to defeat all our enemies and give us peace and make us satisfied forever. So this was no ordinary birth, all right? We have a lot of people, uh, especially around our church, having babies right now. This was no ordinary birth. Joseph and Mary Start out in Nazareth of Galilee. God uses the emperor census to move them back to Joseph's hometown, Bethlehem. Look at verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no place for them in the inn. So here's a question I just want to kind of ask you. What if Mary was in birth pangs on the way to Bethlehem? You know, she didn't take an Uber down there, right? Everybody with us? There are no ambulances to call. This was a long process. And uh, my guess is she went with him because she was getting close to to birthing the Christ child, right? Um, When we were uh, living in East Asia, one of our friends went into labor in the middle of the night. It was very common for uh, most of us foreigners didn't have cars because it's very expensive over there to own a car. Uh, The license plate alone is is very expensive, uh, even tons more expensive than the South Carolina license plate. If that makes you feel better the next time you go write that check. Uh, You actually had to be put in a lottery to get a license tag, and sometimes you'd win, sometimes most of the time you wouldn't. And so uh, some of our friends, they went into labor, and they could not get an Uber in the middle of the night. And so uh, this was, I think, their third child. And so they were waiting and waiting and waiting, and they kept calling uh, one of our other friends who had a van, and they finally woke him up, and it was like, dude, (laughs) hey, you're supposed to be our go-to. Wake up. So they came and got them and took them there, and then she birthed the baby like almost immediately when they got into the, uh, the hospital. So this is, is, is not an uncommon story, but it is a, uh, a difficult journey. Jesus is born and laid in a manger, an animal's feeding trough. From his humble birth, the king will not be like other kings. Let me just ask a question. Would you lay your baby in a feeding trough? Anybody out there planning a barn uh, birth? (laughs) All right. There are a lot of different births these days. The incarnation of the Son of God in an animal's feeding trough puts our glory-craving hearts in check. So let me, this is the first point on your teaching sheet. If you don't have a teaching sheet, they're on the table back there. If you want to get up and grab one, it won't bother me one lick. Okay? Okay. Uh, that's how we talk in Alabama. So uh, translation, it won't bother me at all. Okay, um, When we treasure Jesus above everything else, our glory-craving hearts are put in check. When we treasure Jesus above everything else, our glory-craving hearts are put in check. Listen to how Matthew Henry says it. He well knew how unwilling we are to be meanly lodged, clothed, and fed. How we desire to have our children decorated and indulged. How apt the poor are to envy the rich and how prone the rich to disdain the poor. But when when we by faith view the Son of God being made man and lying in a manger, our vanity, ambition, and envy are checked. We cannot, with this object rightly before us, Seek great things for ourselves or our children. That's an uncommon uh, story, right? Listen to how Jackie Hill Perry says it. I think I read this for you at Christmas, but I thought it was worth repeating. Moses couldn't come near the burning bush. Isaiah could see God's robe filling the temple, but he could not see God's face. Israel couldn't come near the mountain. Uzzah simply placed his hand on the Ark of the Covenant and God's wrath came out in judgment, killing him. 
The priest could only go into God's presence once a year, and even then, there was a constant threat of death. From Genesis to Malachi is the story of people not being able to freely come near to God because of his holiness and their sin. But the glory of the incarnation is that God himself has come near to us. For Jesus to be swaddled, God had to be touched. For the shepherds to praise God for the Savior that was born, God had to be seen. The holy, holy, holy God that Isaiah saw on the throne condescended, taking on human flesh, living with, eating with, speaking with, and touching sinners. This is why he is called Emmanuel, God with us. Please don't miss the mercy in this, that God the Son has come near to us so that we might have direct access to God the Father. Sometimes at Christmas we just kind of gloss over this story, but isn't it magnificent? These people had longed for years and years and years to see God's face. And now here he is in a manger, an unexpected place. Definitely not the place that you would place a king. Verse 8, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field watching over their flock by night. Verse 8, when we treasure Jesus above everything else, we remember this world is not our home. When we treasure Jesus above everything else, we remember this world is not our home. I would imagine that the shepherds knew what it was like to feel like travelers. They were always just passing through, right? Looking for a a green uh, pasture. Can any of you guys relate to this? (laughs) Just, Just passing through? We have a Quite a bit of military in our congregation. We can relate to this. In the rare jewel of Christian contentment, the author Jeremiah Burroughs uh, talks about not seeing earth as home, but seeing yourself as a traveler or soldier. Your comfort and security is not God's main concern. See, I, I think the shepherds would have been very comfortable using the same language that the military uses. TDY, temporary duty, uh, as they're talking to each other, hey, we're going on TDY. (laughs) We're we're gonna PCS to this greener pasture over here, a permanent change of station. I've had to learn all these terms. I didn't grow up in a military family and didn't grow up in a military town. And so when I came here and I had a discipleship group and these guys would throw out acronyms all the time. That's what they're called, right? Acronyms. And so uh, I'm sitting in there, I'm going, are you guys trying to leave me out of the conversation? They're like, Tim, sorry, this is just how we talk. And so some other guys in the group, though, had to admit that they had no idea what that guy just said. And I was like, see, I'm not the only one. you got to break this down for us here. And so uh, TDY, uh, temporary duty, the Y just, you know, it sounded better with a Y on the end. So uh, PCS, permanent change of station. Um, In November of uh, 2019, my family and I returned from living overseas for three years. And so uh, from the middle of uh, November to December In those seven weeks, Shelly and I traveled through eight states. We slept in six different cities from Beijing to Birmingham to Baton Rouge. Do you like how I did that? All the bees? Okay. That's all I got for you today. I don't don't really preach with those kind of things, alliteration. So uh, in the span of one month, uh, we walked on the Great Wall, and we traveled back to our city. We packed our bags. We packed 13 suitcases, 50 pounds apiece, uh, literally 50 pounds apiece, uh, Shelly will tell you this is an accurate story. When I was uh, going to the airport, I was stuffing um, undergarments of mine into my, uh, into my jacket because I had ran out of room in the suitcase. And I was like, please don't search me. This is going to be awkward. <laughs> here, here, here. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing to see here, people. And so um, uh, you never know what's going to happen on the plane. So it's always good to pack some of those. So uh, we, we said goodbye to friends who really felt like family. We had spent the holidays with them for a few years, three years. We gave away a lot of stuff. We landed back in the U.S. and we celebrated Thanksgiving. And so with our family, in our city of over 20 million in Asia, uh, people were always leaving. It was like uh, just this constant uh, rotation. We were always moving. Also, if you found a better apartment, you would just move across town, right? It was closer to where you were going. 
Uh, when we told our church family we were moving to America, uh, another couple told us they were moving to Tokyo. Another couple told us they were moving to Singapore. Another t- couple told us they were moving to Seoul, Korea. And so uh, people were just constantly uh, moving in and out. But what it did for us was it taught us to hold our stuff very lightly. Because I don't know if you've done that before, but you kind of had to leave some stuff behind. Shelly will tell you that she left quite a few uh, garments behind that, um, that the, the washing and dryer in Asia had not been kind to. <laughs> and so, uh, but she, she had to depart with some stuff. Uh, we brought home quite a bit of stuffed animals. And so if you want to have that private conversation later, I'll just tell you how many suitcases of stuffed animals we brought home while leaving some other items over there because we loved our boys and we wanted them to have that stuff, but it really taught us to hold our stuff lightly. People were constantly giving away things. As, as Christians, we must, we, we must remember that this is our temporary home. We're really just passing through. This is a, a change of perspective for a lot of people. When they understand that this is temporary, it's like a breath is what the Bible says. We often find our comfort in our things and not in Jesus, and to be honest, that's a problem. So when we treasure Jesus above everything else, we remember this world is not our home. Verse 8 just says, these shepherds were working the night shift. Anybody worked the night shift before? All right, just give it up. Uh, I, I just learned something the other day. I was listening to this podcast, and I had no idea why people do this. Uh, wives, I'm about to solve a, uh, a question you might have, or you might already know this, and I may just be learning it late. Do you know why so many men back into parking places? One, it's good because you can just come right out, right? But I learned this the other day. I was listening to this podcast, and he said a lot of men back into parking places because they worked at a factory or a plant at some point, and it was required of them because they would back in, and there's less accidents if they just shoot out like that. Because if you work the night shift and you've been working all night, backing out of your parking place is a problem. And so uh, uh, these shepherds were working the night shift. If you'd like to have a conversation about this, it blew my mind the other day. I was listening, and I had to stop the podcast, and I was like, that is incredible knowledge. Obviously, I've never worked at a factory or a plant. And so, um, so this is not the best shift. For those of you who raised your hand, you're like, get me off the night shift. This is not a glorious work. Shepherds had very bad reputations. Because of their work, they could not observe Israel's ceremonial laws They were considered unreliable. They could not give their testimony on law courts. They were a despised class of people, but God has come to them at night in the darkness. This is not the first time we've seen God come at night. In Genesis 28, God came to Jacob in a dream. In Genesis 32, God again came to Jacob at night and they wrestled. It's a great passage to read at another time. God sends an angel at night to these lowly shepherds to tell them that the chief shepherd has come. And God lights up the sky with his glory. Look at verse 9. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying and lying in a manger. So God sends an angel to this despised class of people, to this unreliable people in the world's eyes. God gives some very reliable, unswerving truth. And they were afraid, just like Zechariah and every other person in the Bible that encountered an angel. Verse 11 just says, Savior, Christ the Lord. All of these titles in one verse. You don't often see that. I think this is the only time we have all of them together. This is the the true identity of Christ. A Savior, Christ the Lord, is born in Bethlehem. He's the the long-awaited Messiah. He will save his people from their sins. He is Lord, he is God, he is coming as a baby. The creator God, the maker of all, the ruler of all is going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Just put yourself in the shepherd's shoes just for a second. You're working the night shift. 
the angels have just showed up and they said the Messiah is going to be lying in a manger when you find him. Can you imagine those kind of conversations they had as they walked there with all the sheep? You know, you just don't leave the sheep plugged in like a Tesla, right? So you're taking them along with them. Verse 10 just says, you don't need to fear. You need to have joy. This is good news. This is the gospel. Verse 10 through 12, when we treasure Jesus about everything else, joy will mark our lives. When we treasure Jesus about everything else, joy will mark our lives. That, that great joy reminds me of uh, Jesus' words in um, John 15, 11, which says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus' joy in us. Not your joy in you, but Jesus' joy in you. Who has more joy, you or Jesus? Who has more joy, you or Jesus? <laughs> All right. Some of you don't really believe that, do you? But uh, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> that his joy can actually be in you. I, I gave you this breakdown of joy a, a few months ago, but Jesus others you. Jesus, others, you, there's just, there's just a lot of false teaching in the world today that, that would say all of your joy is in you. You have your me time and your, your, you do what, you, you do you, you believe in you and you'll have lots of joy. I just tell you, I, I meet those people all the time. And I don't usually say it like that, but I usually sometimes I'm like, how's that working out for you? All that joy coming from inside of you. Most of them would agree, oh, it's not working out too well. But I'm going to keep trying it. Because the other option is finding my joy in Jesus, and I don't want to submit to him. Have you ever seen those guys on Dude Perfect uh, make a trick shot? Anybody out there with me? Okay, I love Dude Perfect. Uh, they're a bunch of Christian dudes uh, who live in Texas. Um, they go crazy with joy, maybe because they've been trying the shot all those, all those times. But that shared joy is contagious. Remember Zacharias' praise from last week? It was contagious. And so I just want to ask you a simple question this morning. Is, is your life marked by joy? Like when people are around you, do they leave with a little more joy in their heart? Let me just give you a, a little conversation tidbit, I guess, that Maybe I, I picked up over the years, and I don't do it all the time, but when you're talking to someone else and you ask them questions about them, and you lean hard into it, and you have follow-up questions, not just how was your day, and they go, good. You know, if, if you have uh, kids and you pick them up from school, this is what it's like. It's like an interrogation, Okay. You've got to have 20 questions, and my mom will tell you this about me. I was not a very talkative uh, teenager. I know you can't believe that now, but uh, she would just drill me with questions. And so finally them would spark my conversation somewhere within me, and I would answer one of them. But when we turn our eyes off of ourselves, we can see that it kind of it can bring us joy. Because when, when it's all about you, it really gets old. Is your life marked by joy? When we treasure Jesus above everything else, joy will mark our lives. That's what the world really needs to see, the joy of Jesus living inside of Christians. Verse 13 and 14, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We've talked about this verse before, so I'm going to rather I'm going to uh, handle it as gently and, and correctly as I can. A, a large group of angels suddenly appear with this other angel who had spoken the good news to the shepherds. This is not the first time we've seen a gathering of, of the host of heaven. Uh, look back at uh, 1 Kings chapter 22. This is a beautiful thing about reading your Bible all the way through, just kind of starting to see things tie together. Uh, 1 Kings 22, 17 through 19 says, And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep 
that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. Notice who is on the throne. He's the one we should worship. There's a lot of weird angel worship these days and that's not biblical. Luke chapter 2 verse 14 is, is a verse that's misquoted sometimes. There's some bad translations of it and so I'm going to give you what I think is a good one. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. This is from the English Standard Version, the ESV. It's the Bible that I preach out of, okay? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. You and I can only be at peace with God if God is at peace with you. This, this peace only happens through the Prince of Peace. Peace is am only among those with whom he is pleased. And how do you please him? Let me just say it as clearly as I can. God is only pleased with you if you have placed your hope in him alone for salvation. You are God. I am not. You are holy. I am not. You are the Savior, Jesus. I am not. You have the power to save. I do not. In you, God, I place my faith. I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need, you to, I need to come to you and confess that you can forgive me because Jesus paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. He drank the full cup of God's wrath towards sin and said, it is finished. And then he rose from the dead three days later to proclaim that he has power over sin and death. That's the gospel. When, when we treasure Jesus above everything else, we will share the gospel even when it is inconvenient or uncomfortable. Even when it is inconvenient or uncomfortable. Sorry for the long words. Okay. Spelling's not your strong suit. There they are. Okay. You might be saying, when is it not uncomfortable? <laughs> you're, you're right. It's, it's uncomfortable, which is why many of us have never shared the gospel. So let me just be an encouragement to you today. What are you waiting on? Just, just let it rip. <laughs> Give it your best shot. Testify to the Savior of the world, your Savior. Start with what you know about him. Be kind and, and, and serve, being kind and serving others is not enough. Putting a, a fish on the back of your car is not enough. Wearing Christian paraphernalia, even though that is fine and good, is not enough. Leaving a good tip and a track is not enough. As somebody who's not from Sumter, let me just say, when I first rolled through Sumter, I was like, what's up with all the crosses in the yard? Having a cross in your yard is good. That's fine. But that's not enough. Your neighbors don't drive by. Some of them drive by and think, why are they leaving that up? I guess they kind of rolled up during the pandemic. I, I, I came into town around that time. Have y'all driven through Sumter lately? They're all in the yards. But if you're relying on that to communicate the gospel, I would say to you, you need to open your mouth. Because your neighbors may be wondering why the cross. It's not Easter anymore. You and I need to open our mouths with the life-giving gospel. So what do you say? I would encourage you to say something like this. This is not verbatim. Don't go home and memorize this like a robot. <laughs> say to your coast word, the gospel is the good news. Okay, listen. <laughs> Lighten up, breathe just a little bit, okay? This is a definition I found helpful. The gospel is the good news that God sent Jesus to the world that he created. Jesus lived a sinless life. He died on the cross as a sacrificial substitute for sinners. You might have to break that one down, put it in easier language, right? Rose again, making a way for us to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. I put it on the bottom of your teaching sheet. Why? Because I want you to preach it to yourself. I need to preach the gospel to myself. I need to say it to myself in the mirror. I need to, to say it out loud to others. I need to let the gospel breathe when, 
When I was a child, I heard and responded to the gospel at an outdoor crusade in a football stadium in Northport, Alabama. Little did I know that I would grow up and that would be my rival football stadium. I didn't play football. I played soccer, the world's greatest sport, but that's another situation. Okay, thank you for all the shout outs. Okay, I see you out there. But God reached me in enemy territory, right? He came, brought the gospel to me. He rescued me. And I'll just be honest with you. I placed all the faith I had in all that I knew about God. And I asked him to save me from my sin, to make me his child, and to give me eternal life. My mom and dad were wise enough. They were like, I don't want this to be an emotional experience. We need you to go talk to our pastor. So I went and talked to him, and he, he made sure I understood the gospel. I was not Charles Spurgeon coming out of elementary school. If you ever meet any people that went to high school with me, and you say, Tim is my pastor, they're going to be, he's, he's your what? <laughs> I'd be like, I, I thought he might be in your church, but your pastor, you've got, you, you just need to, You need to check your facts. I think we got the wrong Tim Simpson. And so God saved me, and I grew in my knowledge of him, and I've matured. My boys play the piano. Yesterday we went to their recital, and the the teacher, before anybody got started, this is what she said, and I loved it, and I wrote it in my phone. She said this. She said, when we're practicing the piano, and even today at this recital, we're not aiming for perfection. We're aiming for progress. So I I don't know where you are with the Lord today. But what I, I need you to hear clearly today is that God can save you right where you are. No cleaning up. You put your faith in him. And then, of course, we're aiming towards holiness. But, beloved, we're we're aiming towards progress. There should be a progression in your pursuit of holiness from this time last year till now. You should be able to see a difference. If you're making any kind of headway, Maybe pushing down those sins that so easily entangle us. There should be a a progress in your Christian faith. You should go on to maturity. You shouldn't only know what you knew when you were a child. Let me say this, eyes up here. Do not let your funeral be the most evangelistic event that ever happened in your life. You've got people that will listen to you. Don't give me that smack. They will not darken the door of the church. They just might if you would bring them. You say, I'll meet you at the door. We can walk through it together. You won't incinerate, I promise you. (laughs) All right? There might be friendly faces there. There's coffee back there. Don't, Don't save that to the end and let somebody like me have to stand up in front of people and go, I wish they would have lived out the gospel, but now... Here we are in this room. When we treasure Jesus above everything else, we will share the gospel even when it is inconvenient, even when it is uncomfortable. Look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, just like he said. And just as suddenly as the angels appeared, they went away. They hurried to find Jesus and must have had marvelous conversations along the way. Verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told to them. So the shepherds testified what the angel had told them and what they had seen. What an unforgettable conversation with the shepherds. Mary and Joseph must have been like, wow, he appeared to you too? 
Verse 19, Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. As a mother, she must have thought about Jesus a lot. All of us in this room are children, and, and we think about the people that raised us a lot. Our children go through our minds a lot, but this verse says that she treasured these thoughts. Luke chapter 1, verse 45 said, Mary believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord, and this is, is, is just constant fulfillment over and over in Mary's life. She had faith in God and his word, and she actually believed the words that Gabriel told her. Mary was beginning to understand that God was the one working in her because of who he was, not because of who she was in the world's eyes. Amen. He was a, she was a humble girl to, to, that was bringing the Savior of the world into this world. Verse 20. When we treasure Jesus above everything else, we give God the glory for the things he has done. And when, when he gets the glory, it puts our glory-craving hearts in the right perspective. You and I, just in our sinfulness, naturally want glory. But when we treasure Jesus above everything else, we give God the glory for the things he has done. It just kind of bypasses us straight to him. So how do we apply this? When we treasure Jesus above everything else, we find a new perspective. I'm just going to give you two kind of ending application points here. If you're a believer in this room, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you have a before and after story of your experience with Jesus. I've given you little pieces of mine this morning. You have a before and after story. Before you placed your faith in Christ, your life looked one way. And after trusting in him, your life changed. Your testimony is simply a description of the before and after change you experienced when the gospel came into the darkness. Don't leave out the gospel. Don't tell your testimony like it's some kind of self-help testimony. I started going to church. I kind of read my Bible every once in a while and life was good. That's no testimony. That's just a story. You and I need to talk about the before and after. And you don't need to gross people out with all your sin stuff. What I've found in my life is that every time I start talking about before I was a Christian, everybody can relate to that. <laughs> right? I don't need to tell you how bad I was. You and I can say, Jesus found me in my sin and he saved me. And now this is what he's doing in my life, in my progress in, in my progress towards maturity in Jesus, my growing up. What is keeping you from treasuring Jesus above everything else with your time, energy, talents, and money? What's keeping you? Is it your glory craving heart? And I would say confess that, repent, treasure Jesus, ask God to save you, that you want him to get the glory. Is it the things of this world? Is it stuff? I would say to you, hold your stuff lightly. Because one day it's either going to be in a garage sale or in somebody else's house. Are you, seeking, are you seeking joy in all the wrong places? I would ask that you remember back to John 15, 11 and ask God to open your eyes to Jesus' joy that can be in you? Is it your fear of rejection? I would encourage you, friend, to let the gospel breathe. You don't have to argue anybody into heaven. If you've been trying that lately, let me just kind of give you a little tidbit. Just let the gospel breathe. And then pray. Let God do the redemptive work. He's very good at it. He's been doing it long before you. Today, on this day. Have y'all noticed that today's date is a, just a combination of one, two, three, four, five? It's all mixed up, but it's there. You can 
You can talk about this at lunch. And so uh, just treasure Jesus above everything else. And let the two, three, four, and five work it out. You and I can have a relationship with Jesus that is life-giving. And I'm so thankful that we can be together as a church family and cheer each other on. Because we're all in different steps, right? Let's make progress together. (laughs) If you're here today and you're like, hey, I'm just kicking the tires of this thing called Christianity. That when I pray in just a second, I would just ask that you would pray, God, reveal yourself to me. You're big enough. I've enjoyed listening to this joker talk for a while. (laughs) But God, I know that you know my heart better than I know my heart, so would you reveal yourself to me? You got some things that you're treasuring more than Jesus, then you would just confess those while I pray. Let's pray together. Jesus, your word proclaims over and over that you are worth far more than anything else. You're worth far more than diamonds and rubies and money and cars and the fleeting happiness that some people so desperately crave. Father, would you help us to treasure you above everything else? If there's someone here today and they're like, I'm ready to start this. Step one, Jesus would just be talking to you, saying, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I need you to save me today. I'm so tired and exhausted from being your enemy. I want to be your child. I want to call you father. And so right now I'm just asking God that you would save me. Holy Spirit, that you would come and live in my heart. That you would make it your home. That you would help to root out the selfishness that I've so long to serve. Father, if there's someone here who uh, is talking to you right now, Father, I pray that they would tell somebody about it. Me or somebody that they brought today, uh, that brought them today, Lord, I pray that they would not try to go this road alone. Father, for the Christians that are struggling, like we all do, to treasure you, Jesus, above everything else, I pray that we would open our hearts and say, teach us, O Lord. Show me the things that I treasure more than you. Help me, help me to root them out of my life. I want to place you first, and I, I want to seek you first, Jesus, in the kingdom of God, and let all these things be added to me as well. Jesus, would you renovate our hearts today? Help us to treasure you, Jesus. You're so worth it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.